the church worldwide, and one, one reason why I love the Advent season is that you, you've got the global church doing something together. It's like Easter Sunday too. The, the global church all around the world, brothers and sisters, they're, they're doing the same thing. And, and, and what that is, is this, this season of Advent, uh, uh, this season of waiting. Advent is just Latin for the, the word coming or arrival. And it's this time of waiting and longing and anticipation uh, where we acknowledge the, the deep desires that we have, these deep kind of longings that we have uh, about the world, about our lives. And, th- and we remind ourselves that only in Jesus and then only when Jesus returns are those desires actually and finally and fully met. Advent is where we look back at the year and we look at our life and we look at those places in our lives where it just feels like we keep hitting a ceiling. It's like a frustration. It's a deep angst of, of knowing that things should be different, but they're just not yet there. And it gives those, those things that dwell deep in us, those desires and, and angst, uh, a chance, a freedom to bubble to the surface. And, and we, we kind of pause. Like the idea of Advent is that we would, we would, we would settle down and we would wait and, and, and consider all that we're actually waiting for. What is it in there that we've been waiting for, that we are longing? And it's not always a somber time. Our anticipation can be, should be one of joy. Uh, the, the idea of like a kid waiting for Christmas, it's, it's this longing, this waiting in anticipation of what will be. Like they, they know what will be. And we can know that one day our souls will be at rest, that our hearts will be happy. And so there's this an- anticipation of joy in the midst of Advent. And yet often Advent is a reminder of the sufferings and sorrows of the world as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a pastor in Germany who was uh, imprisoned because he was a part of a team that was going to assassinate Hitler, okay? So like my hero, okay? I would just love, that would just be the coolest thing to be a pastor and then maybe not jail, but to like, you know, be on a team to kill a bad guy. That just sounds awesome. And so he's imprisoned because he, he's found out that he's a part of this conspiracy to assassinate Hitler. And in one of his letters from jail, he compares Advent to his, his, his incarceration. And he, he writes, he says, he says, life in a prison cell may well be compared to Advent. One waits and one hopes. The door is shut and can only be opened from the outside. Avon is many things. It's a season of hope, a longing for peace. It's a time of anticipating joy, but it's also a battle of faith to believe that someone outside of you, someone outside of us will open the door. Will open the door. I wanna talk to you about waiting and suffering. Waiting, but waiting in the midst of suffering. Avon is a season of waiting, and sometimes that waiting is in pain. It's in pain. So I want to talk to you about three things, the battle for belief, the groaning of faith, and the hope of glory. The battle of faith, the groaning of faith, and the hope of glory. First, the battle of faith, verse 18. The Apostle Paul, says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians in the heart of Rome. They're suffering the persecution of Rome. And he says, what you're experiencing right now can't be compared to what is to come. And he's not just talking about their persecutions as Christians, but their experience as humans in a broken world. And he says, what you're experiencing right now can't be compared to what is to come. And he's not minimizing the suffering. He's not saying your suffering isn't all that bad. He's not some comfortable, privileged, high society type that hasn't ever really suffered all that much. And he's like, what is the big deal? Uh, you know, these are first world sufferings. This, you're in the Roman kingdom. You're in, you're in the heart of Rome. No, he's not saying that at all. In fact, Paul's whole life was one of suffering. Paul knew suffering. Uh, after Paul met Jesus, uh, if you remember the story, Jesus knocks him off his horse, blinds him, shows up. He's like, hey, you're persecuting me. And he's like, well, you know, you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting me. me. And, and, he, and, he, and he saves him, he rescues him, okay? And Paul didn't invite Jesus into his heart. Jesus knocked him off the horse and said, you're mine, okay? And so right after that, Jesus goes to Ananias, this guy that's going to help Paul out. And, and he tells Ananias, he says, I'm going to show Paul how much he has to suffer. For my name. 
Paul's whole life, whole ministry was one of suffering. He was no comfortable elite. He suffered. In fact, he gives a litany of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11, where he says, I have far greater labors, far greater, uh, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. That's not like Colorado stoned. That's like a different kind of stoning. Okay, that's a bad stoning. Um, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from all the other things, there is the daily pressure on me for the anxiety for all the churches. Paul knew suffering. But he says our future glory Our future glory is greater than our present sufferings. Go to the next slide. He's saying our, that one. He's saying our future glory is greater than our present sufferings. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Think back at the the sufferings of this year. You had the Uvalde shooting. Uh, you had the, the, the shooting in the, in the gay nightclub in, in Colorado, I think it was. Uh, you had the war in Ukraine. Uh, right now in Fort Worth, you have the trial of an officer who killed Atiana Jefferson back in 2019. You had the, just a little girl. And you think about all the suffering just in this year. Think about your own suffering, like your own personal suffering, what you've experienced, miscarriages and infertility and divorce and betrayal and loneliness and your own sin and addiction. And, and, and you, think about, you think about all of that, all the sufferings. Do you believe that? Where is it? Future glory is greater than present sufferings. Do you believe that? There's a battle for belief raging in you every time you suffer. Is someone going to open the door or not? Is someone going to get me out of this or not? Do I believe that my future glory is far greater than my present sufferings? Now, when we don't believe that, when we don't believe that there's a future glory or that somehow it would be, it would be worth the present sufferings, then, then, then we, we have this unbelief that tends towards numbing and, and distracting and diverting and escaping. Right, next slide. That, that, that we, we kind of tend towards that in our unbelief. Right? We don't think that anyone will open the door and let us out of our suffering. And so we don't wait for it. We numb it. We escape it. We minimize it. We just try to get out of it in our own way. But if we have faith, then it would look like a longing, a believing, a hoping that somehow, that somehow somebody's going to open the door. See, unbelief is where we distance ourselves from God, probably from others, probably from the church. And in those days, in those days of unbelief, that's when we fall into typically the, the self-medication and the addictions and the, the depressions. And, and, and we're in this jail cell locked in and hopeless. But then on the days that faith wins out, there's this longing in our hearts. We wait. It's a waiting in faith. We wait And we even hope that the door will be opened and we're going to get out of this soon. And we believe, we believe that the future glory will be greater than my present suffering. No, having faith doesn't mean you aren't sad. Having faith, like don't, don't let the kind of cheesy Christian, you know, you know, God's going to, you know, he's, he's working all things for good. Like that's in the text. We're going to talk about it today. But if it's used like Job's friends, use it. You know what I'm saying? Like if it's used like that, that, where you can't be sad, that's not a healthy, that's not a healthy counsel, that's not a healthy Christian. Having faith doesn't mean you're not sad. Right? The battle for belief, right, when you have faith, it doesn't take away the suffering, it just gives you strength in the suffering. You should be sad when things are broken. 
That sounds normal. It sounds human. It even sounds divine. Uh, Zach Eswine, in his great book, Spurgeon's Sorrows, he says this. He says, contrary to what some people tell us, sadness is neither a sign of laziness nor a sin, neither negative thinking nor weakness. When we find ourselves impatient with sadness, we reveal our preference for folly a resistance to wisdom and our disregard for depth and proportion. In this fallen world, sadness is an act of sanity and our tears, the testimony of the same. If we have faith, it doesn't mean we're not gonna be sad. It just means that we can have strength in the moment to endure the suffering. But make, make no mistake, the battle every day, right? Every day there's a battle and that fight intensifies in the midst of suffering the battle every day is whether or not you believe if somebody's going to open the door and let you out or not. Whether you believe that the future glory is not even, uh, is far greater than our present suffering. It's the battle for belief. Second, the groaning of faith. We see three groanings, three groans in this text. First, creation groans. Verse 19, for the creation waits, right? Creation is waiting to, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The, the language there, eager longing, it's anthropomorphic. It, it literally means that creation, it, it, its head is stretching out, that it's, it's craning its neck, lay, waiting, looking for the, the revealing of the sons of God. That's us, that's us in glory. So creation is waiting for Jesus to come back to make us like we, we were, like we should be, like we will be. And creation is just craning its neck, waiting for that to happen. Creation is waiting too. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility or, or frustration, vexation. It's not what it's meant to be. To, to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Creation groans. Here, here's the picture. It's that all of creation, and this is, this is like uh, not us. This is not, not humanity. This is the rest of creation. This is, this is, you know, roses and deer and mountains and sunsets and pecan trees and, and lakes, like real lakes, not the fake Texas lakes, real spring-fed lakes, okay? That all of creation is, is, is frustrated about what it is. That, that it knows, right? Like a woman in labor, it can't wait for the pain to go away and this beautiful baby to finally be here. Creation is groaning, waiting to be set free, waiting for someone to open the door and let it out. That it's not meant, or it's, not, it's, it's meant to be way more than it is, that creation is groaning under the weight of our collective sin, our collective evil. That part of the curse of sin in Genesis 3 is not just that we are broken, but that the weight of our sin actually fractured everything. Everything. We were meant to be stewards over creation. We were meant to steward creation and to, to work it and keep it. And in our sin, in our rejection of God and his love, even, even what we were to be stewards over has broken under the weight of our rebellion. And so we have hurricanes and tornadoes and disease and the North Texas weather system, which is like the worst environment imaginable. My family was in the hurricane that hit South Florida a couple of months ago and like where my cousin worked on the beach and where my nephews and, and nieces go and, and where my mom walks, like all of it destroyed. Why? Because creation is broken. It's frustrated. It's subject to, to futility, right? It's frustrated. It knows it should be more. It hits the ceiling and it can't be any more than it is. The sunset knows that it could be so much more. The winds know that they shouldn't destroy. The, if flowers could talk, they would say, wait till he comes back. Then you'll see what I was meant to be. Creation groans, but it's a groaning of faith. A creation isn't complaining. It's a groaning of faith in hope, it says. Right? They're groaning in hope with eager longing. Isaiah 55, 12 says, one day the mountains are going to break forth into singing. And one day, one day the, all the trees of the field are going to clap their hands. But for now, they just groan in faith, waiting to become what they were meant to become. 
So creation groans. And then we groan too, verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We groan too. He's saying as followers of, of Jesus who have the Spirit, if you have the first fruits of the Spirit, that, that we're groaning in faith too, waiting to realize fully our sonship and our redemption, even in our broken bodies. He's talking even about our physical body. That is, that, that we groan waiting for the physical and spiritual restoration of everything that's broken. That physically and spiritually, things are broken. We experience that every day. We're locked in this prison of suffering. And yet, we groan, hoping, believing that somebody's going to open the door. That we would have this full, realized reality of all that we have in Christ. That it was promised to us, purchased by him, and we hope that it will be, that it will come. Now, most of us struggle to communicate our pain. We struggle to groan. If we communicate anything, it's usually a lower form of communication. It's not groaning. Groaning is actually the highest form of spiritual communication. The lowest forms of communication are uh, complaining, anger, sarcasm, outrage, gossip. We're afraid or we're sad, but we don't know how to communicate the deep angst of our soul. God, he invites us to lament, to cry out to him, to feel deeply the brokenness of the world in our lives and to not censor ourselves with him. Do you censor yourself with God? God doesn't care how you pray. He only pray, cares that you pray in faith, even if it's a groan. God knows how we talk when we're desperate. And literally anything, anything that happens in a broken world, anything that shouldn't be, anything that heaven won't know, is an opportunity for you to groan, lament, pray, or grieve. But this groaning, like this groaning is even deeper than like lament. Like this is, groaning is primal. This is the deepest form of, of feeling the brokenness of the world. Again, it's like a mother in the pains of childbirth. This is primal. My, I, my, my wife, she had uh, our, our three babies and uh, she had them natural, right? So at home, uh, in, in, a, in a hot tub or on a, on a big exercise ball. I mean, just, it's primal. It's primal. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've watched it. I've heard it. It's primal. It's a deep, deep longing, right? Something of glory is coming, but it's not here now. And there are no words to say, only deep longings to express. Be encouraged. Your groaning is in faith. You wouldn't groan unless you believed. You wouldn't groan unless you believed that it shouldn't be like this and that he's going to do something about it. You wouldn't be groaning if you, if you didn't believe that. Be encouraged in your groans. You're believing that Jesus will open the door. And you wouldn't groan if you weren't his. Martin Lowe Jones, great preacher in the 20th century in England, he says, your groaning is evidence that you are a child of God. That you wouldn't cry out without the first fruits of the Spirit. God is not mad that you are mad. The only prayers that matter to him are prayers in faith. And we hope, it says, for what we do not see. Verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for we hope for, what, for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So this is, this is we're walking by faith, not by sight. This isn't a passive waiting. This is an active, powerful waiting, an anticipation where we wait with hope and we groan in faith. Take comfort in your groaning. It means you're God's kid. It means you're his. So creation groans, we groan, but then crazy enough, God groans. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I, I confess I don't fully understand this verse. Um, and, and neither does anybody else as I tried to study and read it. Is, is it that God is helping us in our weakness by groaning too? Like, is God groaning? Or is it that in our groanings, the Spirit is giving us those groans, he's interceding in the midst of those groans and he gives words 
to our groaning. It says we don't know what to pray for as we ought, right? In our suffering, we don't know the right words. We don't know what to pray. Sometimes we, you, that you're like, Pastor, I, I would love to do it. I just don't even know what to say. Yeah, exactly. We, we don't know what to pray. And so in our suffering, we don't know the right words. We don't even know what we should really want, maybe, or the desires that we should have. And, and so is that what the Spirit is doing? He's just giving us words to our groanings. I think it's all of it. I think it's probably all of it. That in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, God is comforting his people with a future hope. And he says this, listen, I will pour out a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. He's going to pour out this spirit that will plea, plead for mercy. It's like the spirit mourns with us and translates our groaning into words Right? Like, like he's groaning with us and, and, he, and he's groan, groaning for us and he translates our groaning into actual intercessory prayers that sync up somehow our desires with the will of God. In Jesus' last conversation with his disciples, like one of the last things he told them, he said, I'm going to give you a helper who will be with you forever. A helper. One commentator says the Holy Spirit's intercession is active and effectual. He's not waiting for you. He's at work in you. And he takes up all things that we experience, even our wounds and disappointments and frustrations and setbacks, and God groans with us. Oh, if we would understand the depths of this idea of our union with Christ, how bound to us Jesus is by a spirit that even when we feel something, he feels something with us. And he groans with you. Jesus even knows this groaning himself. In his humanity, Jesus experienced the brokenness of the world. Hebrews 5. He can deal gently with the ignorance and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus groaned too. To him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus groans with us. The Spirit groans with us. You are not alone in your groaning. It's not that you're in the jail cell hoping that Jesus will let you out, it's that you're in the jail cell of your suffering and Jesus is in there with you and he knows the way out. God is with us in the groaning. Waiting and suffering is a battle for belief. It's the groaning of faith and finally it is the hope of glory. Verse 28. And we know, we know, we're certain, we believe and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This whole section is bracketed with this idea of glory. All right, so in verse 18, our sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. Here in verse 30, we ourselves will be glorified. Even back in, in verse 17, the transition into this section, it, it says that we're, we're going to be heirs with Christ, we, we, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. All right, so, so this, this idea of glory is what Paul has in mind as the, the thing that helps us through our suffering. The, the thing that gets us through our suffering is this hope of glory. Now, glory, what it means, this hope of glory, it's the hope of wholeness. It's the hope of um, this idea of the Old Testament word shalom, which in the Hebrew is translated peace, but it, it's far more than just peace. It's, it's this holistic uh, healing and flourishing of the whole being, physical and spiritual, right? That everything is made new. That's shalom. Everything is made new. It's everything being made whole, that sin has broken us, and, and if the weight of our sin has fractured even the, the universe and creation is broken too, then the hope of glory is all that is made whole. It's all made whole in the hope of glory. Uh, all of creation, so creation is made whole. All of creation will be made right again, finally set free. The doors of the prison opened for it. 
Colors will be more vivid. The sunset will be as it should be. Winds will blow rightly. No more hurricanes, no more pandemics. Right? We, will get, we will get creation as it was meant to be in glory. Uh, when Jesus walked the earth, we got a taste of that glory. Have you noticed in, in the stories of, of Christ, like wherever he went, uh, creation did what he said. Diseases, gone. The winds obeyed him. Right? Wherever Jesus went, creation, creation was made whole. There was shalom. It's a taste of glory. Wine even tastes better around him. He made everything better. Creation is made whole in glory. We are made whole in glory. God will finish the work that he started in us. It says we were predestined. His love was set on us. We were called. That's when he wooed our hearts and opened our minds to, to what is true and right about the person and work of Jesus. And then he, we were justified. That means we, we believed and we were made right before God. Uh, in the righteousness of Christ, we were made right before God, and then now we will be glorified. We will, made, we will be made whole, fully conformed into the image of Jesus, perfect. We will be human as we were meant to be, fully human. We are not fully human. We are not even fully human. That, that it's our, our groaning in faith that actually is maybe the most human about us, because it's our our expression of our deepest need in faith and dependence to an almighty God. Uh, the church father, Irenaeus, he said, the glory of God is man fully alive. That God is most glorified when we are most alive, when we are most human. God is working together all things, everything for good. That is the hope of glory. C.S. Lewis in his um, book, The Great Divorce, where this, this guy is kind of, in purgatory, a sort of purgatory, and he's, he's, he's taking a tour of really the kind of the, the first stages of heaven, and, and, and it's this idea of like learning about what, what heaven is really like, and what hell was, and, and how this kind of works, and, and do I even believe this? And, and, and he's talking to one of the guys that was in heaven, okay? And, and that guy says to him, he says, they say, humanity says of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. The door of suffering will be opened. As sure as Jesus opened the door of his tomb, he will open the door of suffering that you find yourself in. And he will let us out. In the meantime, we wait with hope. We groan in faith. We fight the battle of belief with the hope of glory that promises to be far greater than any other suffering that we experience. And in all of it, the Spirit is with us to help. The Spirit is with us to help. I, I want to invite my, my sister, my, my friend, to come out and tell uh, a story of her suffering and the waiting in the midst of her suffering. And then we're going to pray for Jessica and then I want to lead us in a time of response. It is an honor to share a bit of my story with you today. A few years ago, my husband, Matt, and I decided we were to ready to grow our family. We had easily gotten pregnant with our first in February of 2020, and we were so excited. We started getting things for the baby, making plans, and discussing names. But then, while at our first sonogram, the nurse grew quiet, and we could tell something was wrong. No heartbeat. We were in shock and devastated, but we were grateful for how close the Lord felt and how he brought Matt and I closer together as he comforted us during our struggle to grieve our baby. We named Shiloh. After doing lots of testing and doing everything the doctor suggested, we decided to try again, and we were able to get pregnant a second time, a baby boy. It was a rough pregnancy this time around, and it was hard not to fear, but we were hopeful. Then one day, without warning, I started to miscarry again. We named our baby boy Judah. Whereas the Lord had felt close during the first miscarriage, 
This time around, he felt silent and distant. I continued to really struggle physically. I was constantly nauseous, even though I didn't get to be pregnant anymore. We were desperately searching for answers, seeing specialists and doing every test we could, but no answers were to be found. I was dealing with doubt and anger at God. I had finally felt hopeful. Why would he let it happen again? And then on top of that, he was silent when I cried out. I was once again believing the lie that he sees others, but not me. But why the Lord was felt silent, he was teaching me to lament. He wanted me to be honest in my complaints. He was calling me to a new level of vulnerability to seek him in that dark place and silence. During that time, a friend reached out and asked if she could pray over me. And while she prayed over me, the Lord gave me a vision. And in that vision, I'm standing on a balance beam that you can see as far as you can see. And I'm standing there and I'm clenched so tight that I'm shaking, just exhausted, but too scared of falling so I can't move. Then I look down and I see a net below. And I picture myself doing a cartwheel. And then I fall into the net. And the Lord says to me, you are going to fall. But when you do fall, I am going to catch you. He shares with me that he sees my journey and that he cares for me. The very next month we got pregnant. We struggled through anxiety and fear at every appointment, but fought to have hope and joy. Things were going well through our weekly checkups. Then one random day I had signs and Matt met me for a sonogram. We had lost our baby. Another baby boy, Berea. Ever since our last miscarriage, it's been hard to recognize myself. I've always relied a lot on my ability to make things happen, but it feels like that's been taken away as well, as I, all I can do is grieve. I struggle to trust the Lord to come from Matt as he's there trying to be strong for me. The physical sickness comes and goes without answers and I'm beyond exhausted. I just want one doctor to give me something that's wrong so I can try and fix it. One tiny bit of control. Honestly, I'm sick of getting up on that balance beam to try to figure out the next move just to fall again. I'm terrified my story will continue to be one of pain. And I don't know that I'll ever get answers or, feeling, or physical healing, or if I will ever have a child. I'm not promised any of that. But I'm trusting that when I don't recognize myself, it's because God is making me new. My Jesus suffered that I might be made new. He hasn't given me answers, but he has sent prophetic words through friends and even strangers to tell me he has me. And I am going to cling to my Savior as hard as I can so I can hear that clear, soft voice once again. He gives me peace that I can't explain. And I'm going to pray that Jesus I will not let bitterness and hardness grow in my heart as I wait. He is a good God to wait on. And I need more and more of him than I ever have before as he is teaching me to cling to his promises and continue to draw near in my suffering. 